Today the topic is social cognition, which is kind of related. It's on uh, like the connection between judgment, decision making and, and social psychology, which is my other specialty. So the other course that I'm teaching is advanced social psychology. So I show them stuff from JDM. I'm going to show you stuff from social psychology. Uh, but most of this is going to be about uh, cognitive blind spots. So sometimes uh, we have something right in front of us, but we can't figure it out. And we can't figure it out because uh, our mind is attuned to certain things while completely ignoring uh, other things. Uh, perhaps you're familiar with the, the gorilla experiment in social psychology where people are asked to count the number of times people pass the ball from one to another. And then while they're doing this task, a gorilla comes in in the middle of the video and uh, and starts to do all sorts of things and then it, it leaves. And then participants are asked, so uh, did you see the gorilla? And most of the participants are like, what gorilla are you talking about? So their mind is so preoccupied with this thing about you know counting and tracking where the ball is going from one person to another, and it becomes very difficult for them to to notice to notice the gorilla. I'm gonna show you a few gorillas today, uh, but for me to be able to do uh, this in a JDM sort of way, I'll need to play some games with you. Um, so we'll we'll try this out and see and see how that works. But for you to take part on this and I think enjoy this, you need to uh, enjoy enjoy riddles. Uh, and I, ho I hope you do. I'll ask you on the Mentimeter. So we're going to do a lot of Mentimeters uh, today. Uh, so I ask that you bear with me. Uh, just go on the Mentimeter, punching the numbers. And we'll start with this very basic question that just so I know how you feel about, about riddles. Um, so here. See, yeah. So I ask you to rate from minus 100. I hate riddles to uh, 100. Uh, I love riddles. So we've got two people who some don't like, some like a little bit more. Um, so hopefully the majority of us uh, is at least ambivalent, uh, if not towards the, the love riddles. Or if you don't like riddles, uh, it's okay if you don't participate. I just think it's it's a good a good mind mind teaser. Perhaps by the end of this, uh, you'll like riddles, or at least you can take many of the riddles that I'm going to show you today and present this to your friends and family, so you can become JDM researchers social cognition researchers uh, by running these experiments on other people. But I think it's very important before we run experiments on other people that you experience these things uh, on yourselves. So by trying to solve some of these riddles, uh, you'll experience some of, the, some of the, the difficulties. And we'll try and figure out together why these riddles are difficult when they're not supposed to be difficult. Uh, so most of the time there's um, something that, that goes on over there which is not uh, intuitive. Uh, you just need to pay attention to it. So it's a bit like the gorilla, it's, it's in front of your face, but then you just need to kind of pay attention and, and move your attention from where it's directed to what is actually the point of, of the whole thing. So we got like a mixed class, so three versus two and one in the middle. Uh, so that, that's pretty good. That's a good starting point. Um, so I, I hope uh, these two over here on the left that hate riddles or towards the hate uh, won't suffer too much. Uh, bear with me, see what you can do. Let's see how this goes. <clears throat> All right. So there's a math riddle, and I think you're familiar with this math riddle. You've seen this math riddle before, right? So look at this uh, 230 minus 220 times 0 0.5. So try to look at this riddle and solve this. Now you're having this debate with a classmate about how to best solve this. So you're not so sure about this riddle. Uh, so you decide to write an email to your mom. Mom, please help me solve this riddle. Now, your, your mom sends you back this uh, email. He says, you probably won't believe it, but 
Now the question is, uh, is your mom right or wrong? So take a second, think about this, look at mom's answer, uh, look at the riddle, think about the riddle, try and calculate this, uh, think about the debate that you might have with your classmate. And then based on all of the information, everything that you see over here, uh, please try and rate whether your mom is right or wrong. Now, you can write on the chat if you'd like. I, I'm actually curious to think uh, you know, together with you, what's your contemplation about this? Sort of thing? So, so what is going on? <laughs> good, good. I like the way that you think, Kirk, because that brings me to the second question, which is exactly the same question as this. But instead of mom, I'm going to ask you about a distinguished math professor. So Kirk says, mom is always right. The question is, how about your distinguished math professor? Is, is the, your distinguished math professor? Or, no, it's the, same, it's the same scenario. Everything I kept exactly the same. But this time, I asked you what you think about the math professor. So is the math professor right or wrong? What do you say about this one, Kirk? More than mom or less than mom? So by now you know all my all my tricks, right? So uh, try and think together with me with, before I show you what this is about. What do you think this is about? So what's going on over here? What's your what's your intuition tell you about uh, this kind of an experiment? What is going on? So think about what's the way to. So you have a lot of pieces of information over here, right? So you have this uh, this equation. And you can, you can imagine what kind of debate it is. It's like, which part do you solve first? Do you solve first the 230 minus 220? Or do you solve first the 220 uh, times half, right? So there's this debate. It uh, depends on, on who you are, what you're doing. And then comes this answer. <laughs> comes this answer from either your mom or the professor. And the question is, uh, are they right or wrong? So how do they perceive this? Uh, and, and whether whether there's something here that we're not seeing. Okay, so you don't want to share your thoughts on chat? That's fine. Um, <laughs> before I'm going to start the, the next one, you can, if you want, move to that one while we're looking at this one. So I just want to see what it is that you're, that you're saying. Mom, most definitely wrong. Uh, over here, so about uh, we're having now we've, we've got one person here who says that mom is definitely right. Is that your Kirk? Because mom is always right, or there's something else in here that you noticed? What's your take on this? Now, if there's no difference between mom and the math professor, uh, we would expect this to be exactly the same in the next one as well, right? So, are you curious to see? Uh, <laughs> The math professor is more, more uh, likely to be wrong than mom. Uh, and I think Kirk here maybe has shifted his preference towards the, the wrong side. So we're less likely, even though this is a math question, um, we uh, perceive this to be to be wrong. Now, why would this be why would this be wrong? Why are they wrong? Now, how about if I tell you? I'm not a distinguished math professor, but I'm I'm a very undistinguished uh, psychology uh, professor, assistant professor, and I'm telling you that both of them are right. Uh, how could it be that they're both right? So if we look back at this at this uh, at this uh, thing over here, what do you see over here that might make this right? What have we ignored? What did what? Where is the gorilla over here? So I'll let you know, I even tried to highlight this for you and make this a little bit bigger. The, the gorilla over here is this uh, five, but it's not five, it's five exclamation mark. So what is this exclamation mark? So if we'll go, <laughs> I know it's, it's deceiving, it's deceiving, I, I understand. Now I took this from Twitter, so a lot of stuff I take from, from Twitter. <laughs> I know why. So the answer is, so 230 minus 210 is 120, which is 
5 times 4 times 3 times 2 times 1, which is 5 exclamation mark. <laughs> so both your mom, uh, so the way that we uh, do this 5 times 4 times 3 times 2 times 1 is this 5 exclamation. So this is how we mark this in, in math. So actually, we got the right answer over here. Uh, we just uh, uh, showed it in a slightly different uh, way. Now, what I was trying to show over here is that when this kind of answer comes from mom, perhaps we won't pay attention to this sort of thing. But typically, if, uh, let's say this answer comes from a distinguished math professor. So we maybe stop and think for a second what is going on? Like, it's very likely that this uh, person who has a degree has spent his entire life solving math equations. Obviously, he knows uh, that uh, need to do <laughs> to do this part before that part. So what's going on? So if sometimes we shift something about the context didn't happen over here, because we just assume both of them are wrong. But uh, sometimes because the origin is a, ma a distinguished math professor, and then we think there must be something about this one that makes this right. Therefore, uh, I'll, I'll revisit the entire thing, and then I'll notice that there's something over here that is highlighted about this being five exclamation mark. So five times four times three times two. So a little bit deceiving, I agree and understand, but I think now you're kind of getting the, the point of what I'm trying to show you with these gorillas, right? So there is a gorilla, and in almost everything that we're gonna do, there is a slight gorilla over here, uh, which is gonna make things uh, a little bit uh, more interesting for us. All right, so we have we have another one. Uh, it's the same distinguished math professor, so we know by now that he is right about all these things. And then afterwards, he sent you he sends you a, a, an email. And he asks, uh, or, you know, the email has the title, what is the name of the fifth kid? And the email's body message is uh, Cindy, uh, Cindy has five kids. So the first kid's name is, the second kid's is uh, this, the third kid is this, fourth kid is this. Uh, so finally, as you read this uh, email body uh, message, uh, what is uh, your reply? How would you reply to this sort of thing? <laughs> yes, so uh, Kirk has uh, has a hypothesis uh, over here. <clears throat> so the name is what? Uh, so if we look at this, uh, many people see some kind of continuation over here. So Cindy uh, probably would like to name her five kids in a way that makes sense. So the first kid is January, the second kid is February, the third kid is March, the fourth kid is April. So what would be the fifth kid's uh, um, name? But that information is already provided over here, as Kirk has, has uh, <laughs> told us over here. What is the name of the fifth kid? Uh, so this is not framed as a question. This is framed as a statement. So there's a slight difference between a state. So sometimes the missing information, not having a question mark, actually is a very important thing. So we just assume that what is a question were here, it's very obvious that this is a statement. Now, <laughs> the very strange couple that I want to introduce you to where I took this from um, is, <laughs> is this couple. Uh, it's a little, they're, they're a little bit uh, strange and somewhat aggressive, uh, so forgive me for that. Uh, but I think it, it highlights the kind of confusion that might happen in this kind of situations. Cindy has five kids. The first kid's name is January, yeah? Yes. Second kid is February. Third kid is March. Fourth kid is April. What is the name of the fifth kid? May. No! Why not? Because it's not! <laughs> what do you think it's May for? January, February, March, April, May. No, it's not major. I am. You know. Do you know any other days of the month, Brad? Months of the days, whatever you want to call them. Names. Names of the month. Yeah, that. Yeah. Because I don't. April. Yeah. Yeah, it's the last name of the kid. 
yeah. fifth kid. Yeah. So what is the name of the fifth kid? It's going to be called May, isn't it? <laughs> she ain't going to call anything else. It's she not... ain't going to skip May and go, oh, we'll call you June then. It's not um, May. It's not June. It's not any day of the month. It's not a month. December. It's not a month. It's a kid named Cindy after her. What is someone calling a kid named Cindy? After her. No. She's... Listen to what I'm Cindy saying, Jen. Junior. Listen carefully, because you're clearly not listening to me, are you? Cindy has five kids, yeah? Yeah. The first kid's name is January. Goes second on kid and is February. Like this for a while. You see, we're not even halfway through. And it doesn't matter how many times he would repeat this and how many times he would even try to explain this. She is incapable of seeing what Kirk has noticed at the beginning. I don't know if, Kirk, you saw this from before or not, but some people have a real issue even when explained like the point and being repeated the point and telling people that they're wrong, they're unable to deviate from the explanation that they think uh, is, is suitable here. Now, the thing about this couple is that they do this a lot. So uh, every once in a while, he comes up with uh, something else that he tries on this uh, poor girl and she's very, very frustrated with all sorts of things. So for example, he asks her, how many legs do you have? Uh, but he gives her irrelevant information with uh, distractors. I'm just going to show you another example of this. Can you just do this? No. Well, I know you want to go out here, but I ain't done one of these questions in ages. Just give me literally two minutes of your time and answer one of these questions. Because everyone's been sending it to me and saying, ah, oh, get Jen to do this. Well, so, hurry up then. So can you just do it, yeah? Hurry up then. Right, question is, you have five cows. Yeah. Two dogs yeah. and one cat. Yeah. How many legs do you have? How many legs do I have? Um, five, ten, fifteen, twenty, twenty-five. Obviously, you can, you can see what's <laughs> going on over here. She started to calculate because there's a lot of information that was given over here about how many animals she has. But the basic question is, how many legs do you have? So that doesn't change with the number of animals uh, that are in the question. <laughs> so uh, that's uh, something that we can call a, a distractor, perhaps. Uh, when is your birthday if? So another example over here uh, about a question that he asks her <laughs> about her birthday. I don't understand how you're not getting this. I can't believe you just said that to me. <laughs> because this is the easiest thing I've ever said. I know, Bradley, and I've got it right every single fucking time <laughs> you have asked me. Now, I don't know what is wrong with you. What's wrong with me? Yeah. Let me ask you a question before I get answer this again, so everyone else can witness this, yeah? Are you mentally challenged? Brad, don't, you can't say that to me, yeah, because I'm <laughs> getting the answer right. Do you have something wrong with you? No. Right, so answer the question. I have. And I've answered it correct every right. single time that you have spoke to me. No, you haven't. Right, so the question is, I will say it to you slowly. Your birthday yes. is on the same date every year. Yes, I know that. Right. I, you know that. Right, know so that. when's your next birthday if you were born on Christmas Day? Saturday, the 16th of May. <laughs> How many times are we going to go through this, Brad? Listen to what you're no, saying. Let's change it up, yeah? I'm going to ask you questions. <laughs> did you or did you not, about one hour ago, order my birthday card? Yes. So this goes on and on. They're a very, very strange couple. Some of it is a little bit disturbing for me. But they love each other very much, which is very strange because they have this very odd dynamic where he asks her questions that have uh, a point to them. Now, at the beginning, they started with this sort of dynamic, uh, um, you know, he just posted like one video that I showed you about Cindy <laughs> and, and how many kids they have. But then a lot of their uh, uh, people, the people that watch them, they follow them on YouTube, started sending him uh, things and say, can you please ask her this? Can you please ask her that? And for every one of those questions, there is something very interesting about social cognition. Um, so uh, who has the money? So I think in a very similar way to what is the name of the, so who has the money? And they also play with a, a past uh, and, and present and future tense. So for example, somebody has or somebody will have and who has the money. So he gives her a lot of information. She's obviously very impatient and, and they have this strange dynamic between them, but all the information is provided for her to be able to make sense of this. And if they would be able to communicate better 
together, if she would be able to explain this to her rather than making, making fun of her, if she would be able to listen and ask the right kind of questions, they would be able to solve this together. But because of this very strange dynamic, because they're blind to one another, because of everything about the way that this question is framed, they're unable to reach uh, the answer. So some of their followers find this very entertaining. Uh, you know, they keep they keep posing all these questions, but we can actually categorize some of these into different types of, um, of blind spots of things that we're, we're incapable of seeing a little bit like with the five exclamation mark uh, that, that we saw. Uh, one of the questions is like, what do you call a bear without an ear? So another one over here is like, sometimes you know, you're provided with a spelling of something like a bear, but you, it's spoken and the ear is part of the bear. So if you take the ear out, you're left with a B. But as you speak this, it's very difficult to notice this unless you point your attention in that in that kind of uh, direction. Now, the question was, Marty ate um, four six of his pizza. Uh, Louise uh, ate uh, five six of his pizza. Marty ate more pizza than Louise. How is that possible? Um, so the interesting thing is that this was actually presented as a question on an exam in an official school. And um, it's a different pizza. It's a different pizza according to the uh, student. So um, how reasonable is, is this? So what the teacher over here was expecting is to say that this is not possible. But just like uh, Ursula just told us, it's very possible that there are different pizzas. So actually, the student answered, Marty's pizza is bigger than Louise's pizza. <laughs> But then the teacher replied, that is not possible because five, six is greater than four, six. So Louise ate more. Now the thing that we sometimes don't consider is that there is a different way for us to look at questions compared to, uh, compared to others. So sometimes others, in this ca case, a kid, or in, this, in our case, uh, Ursula, were able to see things that we uh, did not see. So there is a possible solution to this. It's not that this is impossible. In this case, actually, the teacher is, is very wrong. Um, so uh, actually, the kid was much more creative in trying to solve this kind of situation. And actually, it's a very reasonable kind of response uh, if this is indeed a different, a different uh, pizza. Uh, I was supposed to ask you over here on the Mentimeter, so I'm going to skip uh, this one and go to this bus. So let's assume that this is a bus uh, in Hong Kong, a school bus in Hong Kong. Uh, which way will the bus go if the bus strikes, starts driving? Now, the interesting thing about this, this question is that uh, most kids are able to solve this very quickly. <laughs> Whereas if you give this to adults, adults actually have a, a little bit of a hard time uh, answering this. Now, if you look at this uh, one over here, what, what, do you, what do you see and how to solve this kind of, uh, of question? So I see we have two answers already. Think about this. Think about what, what, how, how long it takes you to, to answer this sort of thing and what you think the answer, the answer is. Okay, we have five. Left, right, have no idea. So how to solve this? Why is it left or why is it right? How do we solve this? How do we know? The door, exactly. So where is the door? We don't see the door because the door is on the other side. Now, a lot of the adults that look at this don't even think that anything is missing. Whereas for kids who board this every day, it's very obvious that there's going to be a door. So if you don't see the door in front of you, it means that the door is on the other side. And because in Hong Kong, we know which direction uh, we drive. So uh, we know if you were on the right side or on the left side. So the left side, right? So based on the information of where you are and whether there's a door or not that you're looking at, you can see <laughs> where, where the, the door is. And because uh, we don't see the door and because in Hong Kong, it's uh, <laughs> the, the, the driving is on the left in the British style, then we can assume that the door will be somewhere over here and therefore it will go to the right. So 
Uh, if you give this to kids, go ahead after we, we finish the session, give this to the kids and then uh, uh, give this to adults and you'll see that kids are able to solve this a lot quicker, uh, which is quite remarkable. So also uh, here we have an example of something that's uh, uh, hidden. So uh, over here, uh, kids are more more creative but in this case uh, we can see that uh, if we ask the, the kids what they think about this monday it's time for a brain game check out the bus on your screen if the bus started moving forward which direction would it move left or right stumped nearly 80 percent of children under 10 got it instantly because he's smart that way because the door is on the other side <laughs> We'll tap into your common sense yeah. on the new episode of Brain Games, Monday. And so remarkable. Sometimes we think that we're so much uh, cleverer than the kids, but sometimes the kids uh, have uh, an ability to see things that we don't see, uh, which is which is a great uh, demonstration over here uh, with this bus. Uh, another uh, question uh, posed, it's the same website. I took this from the insider here. Uh, that took uh, questions from tests. So this is uh, a question that was given to students. An orchestra of 120 players takes uh, 40 minutes to play Beethoven's Ninth Symphony. How long would it take 60 players to play the symphony? So at the beginning, it's 120 players take uh, 40 minutes. And then how, how long would it take for 60 players to play uh, the same symphony? Uh, and then you're supposed to solve this with a math equation. Now, what's the problem with this one? It doesn't matter how many players you have, Beethoven's Ninth Symphony is going to take exactly the same time to play. So actually the, the person who wrote this and, and the whole debate that came because of, of this question was, was very, very interesting. Uh, so sometimes we're presented with all kinds of information and we're expected to do a calculation that sometimes is just not needed because all of, all of the information is already over there. To think that if we have half uh, the number of players, it's gonna, take, it's gonna take double the time to play Beethoven's Ninth Symphony it does not make a lot of sense. Sometimes you just need to ignore some of the information and just think about this calmly and be able to focus on what is, what is right. Um, I'm going to share with you, so, so you're thinking, okay, interesting, so YouTube and kids, and it's like, why, is, why do we care about this sort of thing? Because actually, uh, this, this is really important uh, judgment, decision-making, social cognition phenomena, and I'm going to demonstrate how. Uh, I actually took this from an, an article. It's called Riddle Me This. Um, it's, it's, it was published not too long ago, so when I saw this, I said, oh, this, I think this is really nice for the students to, to try out. Um, so I'm gonna go back to the uh, Mentimeter. Let's go back to the hospital. Okay, so here's our hospital situation. Let's, let's do this one. Now uh, think about this, um, try, and, try and solve this. Um, so here we have a situation um, a man and his son are driving along and get into a bad car accident. The ambulance shows up and takes them both to the hospital. The son is rushed into surgery. The doctor who will perform the surgery enters the operating room. But as soon as the doctor sees the patient, the doctor says, I can't operate on this boy. He is my son. How is this possible? So I'll give you a, a minute to kind of uh, think about this kind of situation. So the man and his son had an accident. They show up at the hospital and turns out that the uh, doctor operating, uh, supposed to operate, say, I cannot operate on this boy because he is my son. How, how is this possible? Any, any solutions? Okay, we have one solution. Okay, any other thoughts? You can think about this. Uh, in the meanwhile, <laughs> I'm going to move to the to the second uh, second uh, quiz question. Okay, how to? Oh, two two answers. Great. So maybe it's uh, you're you're kind of getting to it. 
Uh, and, and the thing to, to ask yourself over here, given everything that we've seen in the previous one, where is the gorilla here? What are we missing? What is our bias? Where is our blind spot that's leading us to get stuck on this sort of thing? So given this kind of limited uh, um, uh, information uh, we, and us getting stuck, it's like, how, how is this even possible? Um, now you need to think, what is my mind doing to me that I need to change in, or, in order to be able to solve this? So where is the door <laughs> of the bus in this hospital situation? All right, moving on. Barber. So in Nevada, the town, one horse, has one barber in the whole town, just one. For some reason, one of the laws in the town is that every man in town must be clean shaven, completely shaven. Further, Every man either must shave himself or be shaven by the barber. And the barber may only shave those that don't shave themselves. So the question is, who shaves the barber? I think this is slightly more uh, complicated. If you got the first, if you got the previous one, then you should get this without any problem because they're based on a, a similar assumption. So trying to think about this, how could it be that, uh, you know, in this kind of situation, uh, if these are the rules, then who shaves the barber? Okay, we have one response. So that's promising, that's terrific. Three responses, fantastic. Let's move to another one. Accountant. So an accountant says, that attorney is my brother. And that is true. They really do have the same parents. Yet that attorney denies having any brothers. And that is also true. How is that possible? So what's going on over here? So if you answered the first two uh, easily, then this should be uh, easy as well. So it's the same kind of, of trick. So now you have three different scenarios and now you know that the trick is very, very similar. So what is the trick here that's difficult for people to see? Now, if you're, if you're before I tell you what the trick is, uh, I'm going to present a different version of the first scenario of the hospital. And hopefully that will help you understand what the situation was in the first one. So any, any replies to this one, to the accountant scenario? That attorney is my brother. Okay, think about this. I think it will become a lot clearer in this next one. All right, same hospital scenario, but with a slight tweak. Instead of a man and his son, we have a woman and her son are driving along and getting a bad car accident. The ambulance shows up and takes them both to the hospital. The son is rushed into surgery. The doctor will perform the surgery, enters the operation room. But as soon as the doctor sees the patient, the doctor says, I cannot operate on this boy. He is my son. How is this possible? So how is this possible? What's the situation over here? This one is easier to solve, right? Yeah, that's the doctor. Now, the thing is, so what does this what does this mean about the first the first hospital uh, version? What 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 was what was going on over there? So if we go back to this one, doctor is is what is ninety nine percent? Mom's the doctor. So if we look at this uh, scenario, uh, a lot of people get stuck over here because they say, how could the doctor who is supposedly a man who's driving with his son, so uh, you know, can come up with all sorts of scenarios over here. So uh, the, the stomper over here is that most people, when they think of a doctor for, for all sorts of social reasons, think of a male rather than uh, think of, of, a, of a female. 
but it's very clear that it's like, why would you get stuck on something like this? It's, it could be very obvious that a woman is a doctor, can operate on this boy. But the mental image that we have, something coming in, shows a certain bias. And our bias is, is that we, for some reason, we associate a doctor in the hospital as being male. This is our bias. Now, the interesting thing is that I, I wasn't sure what you're going to react over here, but when I give this to large groups, nowadays we have, um, and depending on where I run this in the world, we have uh, different answers. So, uh, for example, the doctor is his mom is a good answer for this. What's another possible answer uh, that's perhaps a, a bit more difficult for us to uh, see over here in Hong Kong, but much easier, let's say, when I run this in the Netherlands? No problem, because the, the son can have two dads, right? So our ability to consider the option that it doesn't have to be a couple of a, a man and a woman. It could be a man plus a man. <laughs> so just think about all the biases that we have. Because of these biases, we're unable to consider all of the possible answers to this. It prevents us from seeing something that is very, very obvious. So this is a very good answer. The doctor is his mom. I don't know what this 99% is, but that's entertaining. Uh, 42, the answer to everything in the universe. Um, or we can consider other kind of biases that we have uh, that perhaps our whole perception of you know, what fathership uh, is or what, what it is to be a parent. So a lot of really interesting things in a very, very simple scenario. So you're thinking, oh, to, to look at, uh, at bias is very difficult. Uh, you need to do, I'll show you all sorts of elaborate things that we do in the lab. Sometimes you don't need uh, a lot of elaborate things in order to see whether you're biased or somebody else is biased. Uh, it was very difficult for me as well. The first time that I saw this, this question, it took me a long time to uh, figure this out. What, what, what could be going on over here? So what, what's the situation here with the barber? So what did we miss? Now that we know the answer to the hospital, what did we miss about this thing about the barber? The barber doesn't have to be a man, does he? <laughs> the barber is a female. Um, so one, one person. So it's, it's uh, actually very, very interesting that despite uh, here, we had two that were able to discover that mom's the doctor. How come the, the, the second one didn't see it uh, over here? Um, but it's funny that even these two consider the barber to be a male, whereas it's not, it wasn't necessarily uh, <laughs> the case. We just assumed because the entire thing over here talks about uh, males. <laughs> Now, what happened in the third one, in the accountant, similar thing, uh, people are stumped with this. So an accountant says, who is this accountant? In our brain, we think accountant, that, that's male. In Hong Kong, I think it's very clear that a lot of our accountants are not males. Um, it's no longer a male-dominated um, profession anymore. But still, when we think about an accountant, the first thing that comes to mind is male. The accountant is female, accountant is female. Okay, so now here we had three that figured this out. So that's an improvement. So what you can get from this is that perhaps if we're exposed to more and more of these and we realized our bias and we look at the pattern, perhaps in the first one, difficult. But then in the second one, we had another context and another piece of information. And then we thought, okay, so based on this additional, perhaps we can like see a trend over here and maybe figure out what is going on. So by the third one, it's it's terrific that three of you were able to uh, realize what the what the bias was and how to correct it. So uh, well done with this. Uh, sometimes uh, the only thing that you need is kind of like to have uh, a, an alternative scenario. So what you can do, one of the tricks is when you're faced with this kind of question, you try and change different parameters in the scenario. So in the first one, a man and his son, you change the man into a woman or you change the son into a daughter or you say uh, a car accident, perhaps you change it to not having a, a car accident or surviving a car accident or you can change all kinds of parameters and, and then you think, okay, so if I change this one parameter, how does that change the way that I view the scenario? So if you get stuck, 
getting stuck, uh, you know, th this makes us feel very frustrated because we can't see something. But in order to get unstuck, there are certain things that you can do, but changing different parameters and uh, then offering yourself a different perspective to look at all sorts of, of things in this kind of in this kind of scenario. So over here, the only thing that you need to do is play with one of the, the givings. So just change a man into a woman, and then suddenly it becomes clear. You think, oh, so that reveals my bias. So whenever you see something and you feel stuck, instead of feeling stuck and getting frustrated, just look at the scenario and see what kind of things you can vary, what kind of parameters you can change in the scenario in order to allow yourself a different perspective, to think about things a little bit differently. Okay, so here we had the Marty. I, all right. What's what happened over here? Missed. Okay, um, let's go back to the where was this? Okay, so the the whole point about this uh, exercise is that uh, through these kinds of things, we can uh, do some really nice experiments. So we can look at people's uh, biases. So the issue here with this hospital uh, scenario is that we have one version where it's stereotype consistent. So father is the doctor, that makes sense. It's very easy for us to look at this. And then when it's presented with mother is, is, is the doctor, is stereotype inconsistent. Now, aside from whether you are able to solve this or not, what other parameters can we look at? So let's say that we're studying social cognition and we're studying judgment and decision-making, and we want to examine the extent of the bias. What can we measure as experimenters? We can actually do quite, quite a lot over here. Uh, I think one of the parameters that we can examine over here is time. So how long does it take us to be able to solve this? It's not necessarily of bias, it's kind of like thinking processes, but one of the parameters that we can examine when we look at this sort of thing is how long did it take the participants to solve this? So even if somebody did solve it at the end, how long did it take that participant to solve this correctly? Um, so I want to show you how this is uh, demonstrated in, in, the, uh, in the article. So you have this uh, dominant control, uh, the one that inhibits a solution. So uh, in this case, the accountant is, is male. And then there's an alternate uh, a control, which yields a solution. So the accountant is, is female. And then the reason for the, the bias, the, the, the thing that makes this a stomper, is what's causing the dominant control. And the reason for this over here is stereotypes. So um, all these things about stereotype consistent and consistent is what's stopping us. But you can think about all sorts of other things that you want to study. So it could be about you know a stereotype, and it could be about um, you know social social uh, issues or you know the availability of social cues. So even this thing about whether you can have a couple that is uh, more than just man and woman, uh, two dads, for example, uh, in terms of the the context. So if you want to study cultural differences about you know a place where. Uh, it's it's legal uh, and, and acceptable, and people don't even think about this in terms of you know, how how liberal society is. So the Netherlands is very uh, very open about this. In the department where I was before, uh, we had all sorts of couples of all uh, of all flavors, and also, uh, for example, an assumption that uh, in order to have kids, a couple needs to be married. So a lot of the people that I know in the Netherlands you know, are just partners. They have kids, but they never get married because they don't want the government to get involved in their in their affairs and, and you know. So are all sorts of things they just don't want uh, religion. They don't want the, the society to interfere in their own affairs, but they do want to to have to have kids. So um, really, sometimes, especially like I grew up, I think in Israel, generally a, a liberal a liberal society. But it was only when I came to the Netherlands and lived there for a while and was able to see who is my department, have different friends, did I realize 
some of my biases. So uh, whenever you go around the world, whenever you're confronted with different situations, you can consider what kind of biases you have about these, these things. So if you want to uh, see more about this, uh, actually, I, I follow this psychology, learning and teaching. This is where I got this from. Now I want to show you how else we study this. So perhaps you've seen this in some of your other classes, especially if you've taken uh, psychology. Uh, we, we look at this as something that's called uh, implicit attitudes. So if it's explicit, we ask you, how biased are you? And most people, when we ask them uh, something as explicit as that, the classic scales, they were like, I'm, I'm not biased at all. I'm a very open liberal uh, person. But when confronted with these kinds of implicit tasks, these riddles, uh, people are unable to overcome this, this sort of, of bias. It doesn't mean that they'll be racist. It doesn't mean that they won't be accepting of others. It just means that in terms of cognitive availability, the way that they judge sort of things, their evaluations, their automatic reactions, uh, it's, it's more difficult for them to, uh, to process this kind of information. Now, how else do we do this? So perhaps you've heard of the implicit association test. Uh, you can try this. For example, Harvard has the project implicit where you can look at all sorts of biases. So you can look at biases in terms of gender, in terms of race. Uh, the race one is very popular in, in, in the US. Um, there, there's, there's a weak, um, sometimes even no correlation between the implicit and the explicit. So what to make sense, how to make sense of the implicit bias is still unclear. So um, sometimes we have some problem to, to look at this as a consistent measure, but I think it's a very interesting uh, test to at least run on, on yourself. So I'm gonna demonstrate this to you, what that looks like in order for you to kind of uh, consider how your, mind, how your mind works. So let's open this up. So this is run on a software called uh, Inquisit. Uh, it allows uh, reaction time. So it measures not only are you uh, doing this correctly or not correctly, but also how fast you're responding. So it allows for people to download a piece of software to their own browser, to their own computer, and then uh, measure the reaction time, the way that people uh, answer this, and then communicate this back into the server. Now, I'm going to uh, do this very wrong. So I'm going to answer things incorrectly, but I just want you to see the paradigm of what that looks like. So I'm going to start this. So what you can see over here, so we had this problem between uh, you know, gender and certain professions. So for example, males are associated more with career and females are associated most uh, with family. Uh, my mom struggled with this uh, a lot. She was sort of like a big boss, a uh, career woman, uh, but she had to struggle her way through in what I think during the 70s and the 80s in Israel was not easy for a woman to do. So this sort of implicit association test uh, tries to measure the kind of bias that people might have. Now, how to do this? Um, this is what they say. In this task, you will be asked to either press E, the left response or the I key, the right response, to categorize words into groups as fast as you can. Now, the first tasks are pretty simple because the only thing that you need to categorize is whether let's say Julia is male or female, or you need to categorize is home more about family or more about career. So I'll show you what that looks like. So you can see uh, male and female, and then Paul, male, uh, Jeffrey, male, uh, John, male, Anna, female. I'm going to just go through this so we can see the next stage. So after we answer all of these, it measures my reaction times. And then we come to this one over here where uh, it says on the one side we have family, on the other side we have career, and now categorize the words into the different. So office is more about career, family, corporation is more about career, parents more about family. I'm gonna go through all the rest to show you uh, where the implicit association test um, tries to measure your kind of bias. So the interesting thing over here is that what happens when we put family or male in the same, in the same side, or we put career and female together, 
So because these are not well aligned, it's going to take us longer. If we are biased, it's going to take us longer to categorize these things together. So this measures the extent to which if you categorize female with career or you categorize female with family, how fast do people categorize this into either direction? And this gives us uh, an, an, a measurement of, of bias. Now, what's unfortunate, for example, with race is that uh, there are positive words and negative words. And then you have uh, uh, white and white people and black people with faces. And then unfortunately, when it comes to white, white people are associated with good uh, more often for people who show an implicit bias. So you can play with a lot of things. So you can change the family and career into something else like good and bad. You can change the male and female into anything else that you want to measure in terms of bias. Uh, but some really interesting stuff that you can do uh, with this sort of thing. So if you want to play more with this, I uh, added in the slides where, of course, I'll upload everything to the OSF. You can go and have a look at all the kinds of implicit association tests that they have. So I want to show you all the ones that they have. Um, there's quite quite a few of them. So you can do this about uh, age, aggression. Uh, you have different languages. I think there's also Chinese in there. Um, a bunch of things, death, depression. Uh, if you just want to do, you just uh, you want to play with this, you can just run a demo and see uh, if you know how how this works. Uh, Hebrew. So uh, fascinating stuff. If you don't want to go all the way with implicit association test, now you know. The only thing that you need to do is uh, construct some riddles. So. That's a that's a, a fun stuff, fun thing to do about JDM research. Okay, if you're already here, I'm gonna show you some um, yeah some riddles from another paper. It's a different kind of paper, so it's not about stereotypes, gender stereotypes. It's about something slightly different. So you're welcome to start already with the first. My question, give it a, a bit more time to see that everybody is back and then we can we can continue. OK, yeah, so these actually come from another recent paper in a, uh, a journal, High Reputation Journal of JDM. It's actually called JDM. Uh, what I like about this journal is that it's uh, not run by a publisher, it's run by uh, uh, it started by a single person, John Barron, uh, completely free, open access, and it demands people to uh, share their data. So um, everything is available, all the materials, everything that you want to, to see in each one of these papers. So I like the level of transparency, and I like how easy it is for me to take and adapt things into our courses. And there's some really interesting uh, riddles in this paper. So for example, the speeding car. How is this possible? So you have this uh, big, big brown cow is lying down on the middle of the country road. Uh, the streets light are not on. The moon is not out and the skies are heavily clouded. A truck is driving towards the cow at full speed. Its headlights are off. Yet the driver sees the cow from far uh, very easily and avoids hitting it even without having to break hard. How is this possible? So already by now you can uh, consider wh where is the gorilla here what is the yes it is it's, it's a terrific uh, thank you Chinu. yeah so I, I really recommend that you follow uh, JDM journal it's one of my one of my favorites so what is it that we're missing over here in this scenario with the with the speeding car uh, what's what's not intuitive for us over here now the nice thing that you can see about this specific article is how they came up with these scenarios and how they came to construct a scenario that is the most confusing to others. So you can play a little bit with this, you can experiment, you can change all sorts of parameters, but this scenario is trying to lead you into an assumption that is actually is not there. So what is this assumption that is not there that is confusing you? Think about that. All right. I'll, I'll continue to the to the second one, and then perhaps uh, you'll you'll get a bit more of information. Bus ride. So an individual bus ride costs one dollar each. 
a card that is good for five rides costs five dollars. Now, a first-time passenger, passenger boards the bus alone and hands the driver five dollars without saying anything. Yet the driver immediately realizes for sure that the passenger wants the card rather than a single ride and change. How is that possible? Over here, there's also a, a certain assumption that we have regarding this scenario that is very difficult for us to see when we read this uh, for, for the first time. So I think over here we had uh, one person who, who found an answer. It's really interesting. Try to uh, vary all sorts of parameters or try and think about how to look at this in a certain, a certain way in order to ease uh, your, raise your probability of you seeing something here that you're, that you're missing. And there's also something here that you might be able to use. I know this one is hard. Well, we're going to move to the next one and see if you can do better. Potato bags. In a Bangladesh market, a small potato bag costs five taka. A medium potato bag costs seven taka. A large potato bag costs nine taka. Yet a single potato in that market costs 10 taka. How is that possible? So it's leading us to an assumption over here that is not needed, not necessary. Once you see it, it's very clear. It's like, oh my God, how obvious is this? But before it's stated, it's very hard to, to notice. All right, so we, we have one answer. So that's, that's terrific. I'll give you a bit more to think about this. It's a short scenario. All right. How about we solve the first uh, three and then we see how we do on the fourth one. How is that? So let's see the answer over here. It's morning, yeah. So I think the assumption over here, the way that everything is framed is to lead you to believe that we are driving during nighttime, but there's nothing here to say that this is nighttime. It could be daytime. So there's no need for street lights. There's no need for anything to be, you know, the moon is not out. Of course it's not out, it's, it's, it's daytime. So we assume that this is night because we were led in this kind of direction, but it's not necessary. So just by ignoring certain things in this scenario, we might be able to think of an alternative uh, or adding information over here where uh, actually this is taking place during uh, daytime. And then it's very obvious that you can see the cow without hitting it. Frustrating answer, isn't it, right? It's like, uh, what the hell does he want from us with this? I just wanna say, that uh, a lot of information, this scenario is very reflective of situations that we have, for example, in organization. So, you know, when I come, when I come in to, into an organization, especially if I'm in a different cultural uh, context, I have a lot of assumptions and the assumptions are that things are the way that I understand them. But then people are acting in a very strange, in a strange way. So I look around me and I don't understand what is going on. And then it's very clear to me that some of my assumptions about what's happening need to be changed. So by discussing with others, by you know, brainstorming, by trying to think about every step of the way, perhaps I'll be more likely to figure out what is going on. Now, I know that this one uh, was, was difficult, this uh, bus ride over here, I'll show you the, um, so the answer over here was it's uh, daytime. So, the way that the bus driver could figure this out is that if you give him five coins of one dollar, you could have given him just one coin of one dollar, and that would mean that you just want the one ride. If you gave him five coins of one dollar, it's very obvious that you want the card and not the one the one ride. So we just assume that if it's five dollars, if we gave um, the driver uh, five dollars that it comes you know as, as a bill but it could be just just the coins how about the third one let's see that i hope that was clear the potato bags let's see what the response was <laughs> it doesn't include potatoes well done so whoever got this uh, terrific so we have this assumption that this small potato bag actually has potatoes in it but not necessarily has potato it could be meant for having potatoes in it, 
but doesn't have to have potato in it. It could be just empty. So uh, in this case, the way to resolve this sort of thing is by these bags being empty before we buy the actual potatoes, which makes sense when we go into a supermarket, uh, you know, and they want to charge us, especially a plastic uh, levy where um, they try to um, reduce consumption. So uh, some, somehow just by this being called a small potato bag, we have some assumptions. So very important for us when we communicate all sorts of things to be much more clear about what it is that we're saying. So both in terms of communicating to others and in terms of making sense of a scenario, we need to really think about where can this go wrong? Where might we uh, make some assumptions that aren't needed? Maybe if it's in education. You think so? That's actually a really, do you want to run an experiment on this? So Ursula says, maybe if it's in Hong Kong dollars, we can know the answer more easily. Um, okay, so maybe if you think about a local context or you think about Bangladesh, so just by because it's Bangladesh, you're thinking maybe there's something off about it. But if we would make it about Hong Kong, we would say, oh no, so this has to, this has to be the answer. So let's say, Ursula, that you're doing a thesis or an internship, or if at some point, I don't know what year you are, you want to come and do a, do a thesis with me or some of the other JDM folks over here, this would be a really nice extension, right? So you would run this, and we would uh, run this, let's say, with a Hong Kong uh, student, and we would randomize them into two different between subject condition. One of them will see the Bangladesh version, the other see what the Hong Kong version, and then we'll see if it's uh, there's some differences between these two in terms of figuring out this the this uh, the, the solution to this. So. Even with this one suggestion, that sounds like a hypothesis. With a hypothesis, we can form uh, tests to look at this. And as you can see, with all of the JDM stuff, you don't need elaborate stuff. It's not implicit association tests, you know, clicking and reaction times and all this. We can really have very simple between subject. It's a simple t-test. One uh, group sees uh, Bangladesh, the other group sees Hong Kong. And, and then you just randomize uh, between run a t-test and you've done a beautiful extension. You can publish this in a place like judgment and decision making. And it says something really interesting, some really interesting insights of what, whether the context, uh, whether the, the context is more familiar will help people figure this out. And then if it's not, then you can ask people perhaps to envision this as if it's happening in their own market. You can think about all sorts of solutions, interventions, about how to debias um, people if you really figure out that this is this is a factor. So I like these kinds of, of suggestions. Uh, if you have more suggestions about what could help us to solve this better, uh, please do tell me and we can think about how to run experiments on this. All right. Um, final one. Let's see if you can, now that you have experience with these uh, three different scenarios, how about the farmer eggs? So every morning the farmer had eggs for breakfast. He owned no chickens and he never got eggs from anybody else's chickens. Where did he get the eggs? So what is the assumption here that we have? How is this leading us? You can, you can imagine, although I don't know if Hong Kong has farms, you can imagine that this is a farm in Hong Kong. <laughs> okay, we have an answer, terrific. Three answers, beautiful. So I think you've learned something from the previous three. Let's see what your reactions are. And then, duck eggs, terrific. What, what's the welcome part? Another animal. So not all eggs come from chickens. You can have eggs from different chickens, for example, duck eggs. So that's a really good way to solve this. So we've improved from the first three, we're like, oh, what's going on over here? It's a little bit difficult for us. But now that we have some experience with all of this and we see kind of like the trick, perhaps it's easier for us to make sense of, of the whole thing. One last one, boat people. And I think this is tricky, especially in Hong Kong maybe. While walking across a bridge, I saw a boat full of people. Yet on the boat, there was not a single person. Why? Okay. So we have some answers, that's terrific. So it seems like you're on a roll. You can, you can imagine all sorts of things, 99%. <laughs> all right, so let's see what the answer is. What, what is on the boat? 
and on the boat there is not a single person. Who is who is they? You need to you need to elaborate. Not the same boat. Okay, that's a little bit maybe more in the right direction, but uh, it is it is the same boat in this kind of situation. But I like the way you think. So already you're thinking maybe not the same boat. Terrific, good good direction. Any other directions? What could be misleading about this sort of thing? And this is a trick with English. It's it's uh, I'm uh, now that I'm going to reveal this to you, I'm going to feel a little bit embarrassed about this. <laughs> but when you look at a single person, a single person could be one person, or it could be a person that is single. <laughs> so uh, empty bags was the. Um, answer for the potato bags, um, ducks. So some of you got this correctly. Uh, they're all married. So there are no single people on the boat because they're all married. So that's um, that's interesting. Now I want to show you the, the way that this has been summarized in the article. It's a, it's a great article. I really like this sort of thing. The dominant control and the alternate control. Accountant is male, accountant is female. You remember this from, from the previous one. Uh, so this is this is the article for these these thumpers over here. So um, you can see how people responded. So the way they, they started by asking people, what do you see when you read these kinds of, of scenarios? So the first step in this kind of experiments is that you can give many different versions. I didn't put all of them, but you can see just from the number 21 that there's actually quite a few scenarios for each one of those. And then you can make ma many different scenarios by varying different parameters. And then you can ask your participants, what do you see? Now, you might think everybody sees this. It's very, very obvious. But when you start running these things, so I run this, I think, uh, so this is, came out 2018. So this is the second year that, that I'm running this. And at the beginning, I wasn't really sure. Like when I asked a colleague, what, what do you think? How, how is this going to play out? It's like, everybody's going to figure this out. It's very easy. I'm like, I'm not so sure. And finally, I think uh, our, our students in very, very much in line uh, with the participants in this. Uh, some people see this or some people are familiar with some of these stumpers, but most people are in, unable to see this. But if you play with uh, different versions, so for example, they had a version with an accountant and had a version with a nurse. So uh, you can ask things about like, for example, what do you envision? Is it a male nurse or a female nurse? Uh, you know, in terms of the, the bus ride, do you see a $5 bill or do you see uh, different coins? So an experiment doesn't necessarily have to be, you already do the manipulation. An experiment can actually also be tapping into the way that people make judgments and decision, the way that they think about things. And it's okay to ask people, what do you see? Tell us, in order for us to be able to, uh, to tap into their cognition. So sometimes if you have an experiment and you want to do an additional extension, not in this course, because we try to keep things as, as quantitative and as straightforward as, as possible, but let's say you're running uh, you know, in your thesis and you want to know why people are answering a certain way. Let's say even if the experiment doesn't work, you had a hypothesis, but then it didn't turn out as expected. It always helps to first have them answer something quantitative, let's say for a scale, and then have an open-ended question and then ask them, so why did you answer the way that you did? And then sometimes you realize that your assumptions about what they see are very, very different from what they actually what they actually see. So uh, a question like, what do you see in your mind's eye when you read a scenario is a really good question to ask whatever the scenario is. So in, in your judgment and decision-making replications and extensions, many times you have a scenario and we assume all sorts of things because we vary, we manipulate very specific things about this scenario. But let's say that this doesn't work out. We're not running a replication, we're running something new. And we want to know if it works out or if it doesn't work out. If it works out, why did it work out? Did it work out because of what we thought or because of something else that's going on? Maybe there's a confound. If it didn't work out, why didn't it work out? How do they see this that's different from what we see? So a simple question like, what do you see? is very, very helpful. So I, I like this uh, sort of thing. So I, I recommend that if you want, if you're interested in riddles and you want to do something about this in your internship or your thesis or, or later on, it, it helps to, to read these kinds of papers. They're very clear and they're very uh, simple. Now, finally, uh, we have, okay, we have about half an hour. 
think that's even longer than what we actually need. So in the first uh, section, I wanted to give you a taste of social cognition and, and judgment decision making using uh, riddles, looking at implicit bias, looking at all sorts of assumptions, uh, helping you think a little bit clearer about uh, what kind of experiments we run, uh, and that it doesn't need to be a very, very complicated um, or, or elaborate. It could be something that's very, very simple. Now, if you recall from the previous uh, session, I showed you a few of our application that are looking at um, purchases. So for example, uh, less is better, uh, less is more. So is more information better for you when you make purchases? Is, is less always uh, considered to be worse or sometimes less could be uh, perceived to be uh, better. So looking at all these effects, we actually realized that there are very simple ways for us to manipulate the context or manipulate our reference point in order uh, to get the desired, the desired um, um, effect. So uh, in nudging, they use this a lot. In marketing, they manipulate us all the time. When we walk into the supermarket, you know, our reference point always changes. So we have things like the decoy effect, if you remember the, the popcorn uh, from, from previous sessions or uh, the reference point in terms of like, what is the range, just varying the range and making you feel like something is better just by varying the, the range of the worst to the, to the best. So effects like this are, are very meaningful and powerful uh, if you do them uh, correctly. And they're being used by both marketers and by, um, behavioral uh, insights teams in policy in government and, and all that. Uh, the ones that we chose to give you for the replications and extensions are a bit like that. So they're all about classic JDM effects. So for example, the default effect or the framing effect where we try to see how does this impact uh, decisions about health or how does this impact decisions about uh, environment. So for the remainder of this uh, session, for however long it would take, I want to introduce you to two replications that we uh, ran. Uh, they're currently uh, hopefully finalized um, in, in the journal. So I think it's the second or third uh, review round that we got. And hopefully after this, so we got some uh, mostly positive uh, reply, uh, Shafir over here. Uh, has a slight problem with us. He doesn't like us replicating his stuff, especially from very long ago. So with some of the failed replication, he, he responded um, in, in, a, in a not uh, very enthusiastic way. But even with, with all of that, we were able to kind of communicate and talk about all these things and uh, both with the failed and the, the, success, the successful uh, replications. I believe that this is uh, going to make it to publication very, very soon. And this is by the students. So the students uh, ran this in our previous uh, JDM sessions uh, last year. So I want to give you a taste of what that looks like. Very, very simplified stuff. Don't need to overthink this. Just go with, um, with what it is that you, that you feel is right in this kind of situation. Okay, so this is our, our scenario. It's a little bit long, so bear with me. Um, but uh, at the end, you're faced with a selection between one of three options. So what is this scenario? Imagine that you've just taken a tough qualifying exam and it's the end of the fall semester. So you're coming up, uh, it's happening in a month or so and you feel very tired or run down and you are not sure if you're past the exam or not. In case you failed, you have not taken, uh, you have to take the exam again in a couple of months after the Christmas holidays. So you now have an opportunity. Let's say that this is normal circumstances and you can travel to other places in the world. So you can buy a very attractive five day Christmas vacation package to Hawaii <laughs> at exceptionally low price. Uh, Hawaii is a dream of mine. Always wanted to go. I haven't been there yet, which is uh, kind of remarkable given how, how much I've traveled the world. But hopefully at some point I'll get there as well. Thing is, the special offer expires tomorrow while the exam grade will not be available until the following day. Now the question is, you want to travel, you want to get away, um, very good price on this Hawaii uh, dream vacation during Christmas. You know, Christmas is cold in most places in the world, uh, not so much in Hong Kong. Hawaii is this paradise, always warm. 
good weather. So the question is, would you buy the vacation package or perhaps decide not to buy the vacation package? You're not sure if you pass the exam or not, but then there's this third option. And the option is, how about you just pay a $5 non-refundable fee in order to retain the rights to buy the vacation package at the same exceptional price the day after tomorrow. So by then, you will already know what the uh, result of the exam is. Now, if you have booked um, from Cathay Pacific recently, some of the bigger airlines, they all offer you an opportunity. If you see a good price and you're not sure if you wanna buy this, a lot of them do offer you this third option. Like I think it's something like 20 Hong Kong dollars, 50 Hong Kong dollars. You can just like put it on hold. Uh, and then if you decide not to take it, nothing happened. You just spend 20 or 50 Hong Kong dollars in, in securing this kind of option. But then if you want it, you can make the decision later. So there is a level of uncertainty here because you don't know something about the exam. You passed, you didn't pass. Um, and then um, if you're not, if you don't know if you want to buy or not buy, then you can take this uh, uh, $5 non-refundable. Now, three of you have answered, so I'm going to move on. Now, imagine a very similar scenario to this with a slight difference. So imagine that you did take this uh, tough qualifying exam, but passed it. Right? You know that you've passed it. You don't need to wait for the, for the results. So in the previous one, uh, you weren't sure if you passed or not, but in this one, you definitely uh, passed. Now you have the opportunity to buy this very attractive five-day Christmas vacation and the special offer expires tomorrow. So now would you buy, not buy, or would you pay a $5 non-refundable uh, fee in order to retain the rights to buy this vacation uh, the day after tomorrow? So a slight difference from um, from the previous from the previous scenario. Here, there's no uncertainty about the exam. Here, you actually know that you passed the exam. So I'll wait for the three of you to make this uh, this selection. The third one still thinking. Okay, we have three. Great. So now that we have. Uh, four here, okay, three here. So maybe the fourth one will join us soon. Now imagine exactly the same scenario, but do you want to guess what the third condition is? So the third condition is you failed the exam. So imagine this exactly the same sort of thing, the same kind of circumstances, but you already know that you failed the exam. Now, you know that you will need to take it again in a couple of months after the Christmas holiday. But then again, you, you have this opportunity to... Uh, to, to buy this Christmas uh, vacation in a special price, but it expires tomorrow. Do you buy the package, not buy the package, or pay a $5 non-refundable fee? So first of all, in terms of experimental design, typically we give this experimental design in a between subject design. So typically we show, we have three different conditions and we randomize people into one of these conditions so they don't know what happens in the different conditions. Now you as a participant saw all the three conditions and then we shifted this from a between uh, design into a within design. Now, if this would be a real within design, it would be random order. So each of you will see this in a random, a random order, but still hopefully we can gain something by looking at, um, at these three. All right, so we have four, four, and five. Uh, let's let's have a have a look at this. So let's see what you wrote over here. So um, over here in the first one, where it's not sure if you passed or fail, we have uh, two participants, uh, two of the students that are saying that they want to uh, pay this five this five dollar non refundable uh, fee. Now let's see what happens if you pass. If you pass, <laughs> definitely buy the vacation. No doubt about that, you will go for it. Now, what happens over here? Uh, most of us will buy the vacation, uh, but the two of us will not buy uh, the vacation. And the interesting thing is that in these two, if you think about this, over here, nobody actually took this uh, pay five, $5 non-refundable uh, fee. And that makes sense because there's absolutely no uncertainty. You have all the information and you can make, make a decision. Now, 
you're now experts in experimental design and you're uh, you have a little bit of an idea of the kind of games that we play in judgment decision making now what is this effect about what what are we trying to to see over here so we saw uh, sort of like a shifting uh, preference we have these uh, two who decided to to postpone so obviously we don't have all four over here we don't have three and two we shifted our preference in, in order to buy to buy this uh, five, five dollar, but the curious thing is, is that in almost in, you know in both of these cases, this case over here, and in this case over here, let's say that we look at things that are more like on the aggregate side, our inclination is to buy the vacation package. Now we don't have a very large sample. I'll show you the results from our replication, but if you run this with large enough samples, you'll see that actually people do tend to buy the vacation package regardless of whether they failed the exam or not. So the question is, if you know that you want to buy the vacation package, regardless of whether you passed or you failed, why are you willing to pay $5 in order to wait another day? So this is what that paper was about. So if we look at this, uh, uh, this paper over here, we have a sure thing principle which is violated over here in this, in this. So we had a group of, of four students that worked on this and it's called the disjunction effect, um, how people act under uncertainty. So the thing is that if we look at this kind of design, the sure thing principle, um, no, wait, hold on. Yeah. So if uh, people say, you know, I passed the exam, I will go on the trip because, you know, it's a reward. I've done well, I deserve this. The thing is, is that if they fail the exam and they go on the trip because they say, I need to relax from all this tension, you know, I want, I want to um, uh, re-energize after I fail the exam. So in both of these, uh, it seems like people tend to go for the trip, at least as aggregate. So the question is, what would be the right answer over here? So if we have both of them leading towards taking the uh, trip, both of them, then this should also be um, going on the trip. But if you don't choose that option and you would rather wait for something else, even though you're, you, you know that regardless of pass or fail, you will go on the trip, then why would you go for um, you know, waiting? And a lot of people tend to wait when they're under uncertainty, even though if they consider both options, if they would put themselves in the situation of what would happen if I pass or what would happen if I fail, they already know what the answer is. They want to go on this trip. Hawaii is wonderful. We want to warm up during Christmas. This is the once, um, one, one opportunity that we don't want to miss in terms of the price. So why do we have to wait? Why do we want to pay money in order to, to wait? So we have a sure thing principle, which says if we go to the trip anyway, we would, uh, even if we don't know if we passed or failed, we should still go on the trip. But uh, it seems like with this disjunction effect, the sure thing principle over here is, is violated. So uh, originally uh, they showed this kind of, uh, I took the slides from the students. So well done students in terms of visualizing this whole thing. If you're, if you're doing slides, for your experiments and replications and extensions, do learn from, from these students. They've done well. We're gonna share all the, the slides uh, from previous years with you so you can just go and have a look at what they've done. So we had three groups, uh, two groups saw the past uh, uh, or fail. And then the third group uh, had the unknown. And then you can see, it's very curious that uh, the rates are actually quite similar for pass and fail. Most of the people tend to go for the um, for buying the vacation package but then when some uncertainty is introduced whether it's pass or fail people somehow shift to wanting to pay five dollars in order to retain rights to make the decision later so we like to postpone our, our choices even if it's not needed we're even willing to pay money in order to to get people to to give us that that option, so that's that's curious, uh, and it's actually uh, quite quite a, a a big a big effect over here if we if we examine if we examine what it is that uh, that they found in the original. Now we ran this replication at least with this scenario that I just showed you, the the extension that the students came up with, and it's a very simple extension but very powerful. 
is that the original Tversky and Shafir, so Tversky is the same Tversky from Tversky and Kahneman, so the one, uh, he passed away four years later in 96, uh, but if he would have been alive, he would have won the Nobel Prize. Shafir was one of his uh, students, uh, now a very prominent uh, scholar, I think in uh, Princeton, if I'm not mistaken. So what would they found in 1992? They ran this in a between subject design. So you can see the results over here. We also ran uh, between subject design with 445 uh, participants over here. And you can see the results are very similar across these two. But what the students added, and I love this, is that they said, how about we uh, show everything in a within subject design, perhaps not a between, but a within. And what they actually showed is that even with a within subject design, uh, we can see we can still see uh, the effect. So even when people see all the three options, there's still something about this uncertainty. Even if they realize. So what I did in our experiment over here is that I made the disjunct the disjunctive option first, and I think that kind of made it a little bit uh, more uh, difficult for you to understand what might be going on, but. Uh, even if you randomize the order, we can see these kinds of effects that you can see in the uncertain option, uh, there's a lot higher. Uh, so the rate over here of people choosing to pay the $5 is much higher than the rates in the pass or the fail. So what the students decided to do over here in this uh, paradigm is run exactly the same uh, materials, exactly the same design, the same conditions. The only thing that they decided to do in terms of their extension is just shift this to a within subject design. And that's perfect. That's a really good design because now we know that it's actually, it's, it's not relevant whether you, know, you see the other conditions or you don't see the other conditions. Even if you see the other conditions, you violate the sure thing principle. And the way that we achieve this is that actually a uh, subject were randomly assigned. So you can see the number of participants is exactly the same because at the beginning, we randomize them whether they will see the between subject design or the within uh, subject design. So very clever extension by, by the students that really allows uh, us to uh, gain insights about something as classic as the disjunction effect with Frosky and Shafir in 1992. And to show that in both of these designs, it works as, as expected. Now, even if it doesn't work, that's also very valuable. So if you remember last week, we had the less is better by she. So uh, if you remember, we had all sorts of interesting things like the coat and the scarf. And it seems like over there, if we run this in a between subject design or we run this in a within subject design, there is a clear uh, difference between those two because if people are able to see both conditions together, the effect disappears. So last week we had an example where the effect disappears if you shift between uh, the between subject design and a within subject design. But here we ran both of these together and we actually showed that this maintain uh, despite uh, whether we use a within subject design or a between subject design. I hope that's clear enough. I just want to say it's a really good type of, of extension uh, uh, to run to suggest when you're looking at these classic effects. Some effects, disappear when you move to a within subject design, some effects um, um, remain, some effects even become stronger. So some of the effects that we um, discussed before seem to be, be even stronger. So I know the omission bias or some of the stuff by uh, John, John Barron seem to be much, much stronger you know, within subject design where actually the comparison makes people even more strong in their, in their evaluations and the way that they react to the reference points. So that's interesting. How long do we have? 10 more minutes. All right. So I think we have one more. And I just want to say, uh, hopefully this will be published soon. All the students are, uh, are part of this. Uh, and Ignacio helped us to, to bring this to, to publication. Another one by Shafir and, and Tversky, uh, a little bit later. So this is a year after I think he passed away, Tversky passed away. And, and this is about money and processing and a lot of really interesting insights about how to think about money, the way that you would think about money. So let's go back to the Mentimeter and see how you would answer uh, these questions. So uh, think about this scenario. I see one of you already answered this. Who do you think was happier? So let's say that we have Anne and Barbara and they graduated from the same college a, a, year, a year apart. 
Now, upon graduation, both took the similar job with a publishing uh, firm. Uh, the first yearly salary for both of them was uh, 30,000 30, uh, US dollars. Uh, but then uh, for Anne, during her first year on the job, uh, there was no inflation. In her second year, Anne received a $2, 600 uh, US dollars raise in her salary. Now, Barbara also started with a yearly salary of 30,000, but during her first year on the job, there was a $4% uh, dollar, uh, 4 inflation. And in her second year, Barbara received a 5%, so 1,500 US dollars raised in her salary. So we have both the percentages, we have the inflation rate and we have the actual, the actual money uh, gain that they had. So it's very obvious that over here, Anne received uh, less money increase uh, than, than uh, Barbara, but there's other parameters involved over here. And the, the question that they pose to the participants, so Shafir and Tversky uh, are asking, so which one do you think at the end of the second year, who do you think was happier? Is it Anne? Uh, or is it, or is it Barbara? Okay. Now, the follow-up question to this, which is very, very uh, similar question. So exactly the same parameters. I did not change the whole thing. Now, the question that I have for you is that who do you think is more likely to leave her present position for another job? Uh, is it Anne or is it Barbara? So the first one was happiness. And the second one is more about who is uh, more likely to, to leave the job. Now, obviously there's a relationship between these two. They're supposed to be to some extent opposite to one another. So like, let's have a look at uh, what you said over here. Uh, who do you think was happier, half and half? Um, so that, that's, that's interesting. So there's no clear, clear cut thing over here. Also half and half, so I think they, they both they both uh, switch. I'm actually really uh, interested interested to uh, hear why you chose Anne or why you chose uh, Barbara. Uh, but what I'm going to do um, while you and while you write for me in the chat is just show you um, uh, the results. So we have quite a few uh, so other students that did this, and this is called the money illusion. And we have this scenario over here, and this is a between subject uh, design where people are rating uh, job satisfaction, happiness, and economic terms. And at least when we ask people about economic terms, people are able to uh, decipher this. So they know that inflation rates are, you know, they matter. And if we look at this sort of thing in terms of like the nominal salary and the real salary increase, they are able to deduce that the real salary increase for Barbara is actually lower. So even though this was 5%, uh, because of the inflation rate, which is 4%, actually the real salary increase is only uh, 1, 1%. So you have two ways of looking at things. You look at things that either nominal uh, salary raise, which is just like uh, what is the real money, um, the, the actual money number that you see uh, raise in your bank account. And then there's real salary where you look at reference point and the reference point over here, which is very important for people and people don't take this into consideration is the inflation rate, especially people like me. So I've been to different parts of the world. I live in Hong Kong. I came here from the Netherlands. Before that, I lived in the US. I grew up in Israel. I have many different bank accounts. Uh, that have most of the salary and the terms that I got from, sometimes I can't control this because they took my money and put this in a, in a pension fund and I can control this and I get different reports about the increase of let's say the pension fund. So that my pension fund in the Netherlands and my pension fund in the US and my pension fund in Hong Kong, they raise and I get the bottom line, how much money um, was accumulated in, in that pension fund. But what I don't know and I need to take into account is that different countries have different inflation rate. So it might seem to me like, oh, I got $1,500 more, but if the inflation rate is much higher in certain places over, over others, then of course it's, uh, I need to, to compensate for that. And a lot of people focus on nominal raise rather than um, the, the real salary raise. Um, so whenever you compare the jobs that you go into, Whenever you look at the salary increase, about your terms, if you get, I don't know, stock options, whatever it is, you need to be able to see not only 
the amount of money, but also how is this in comparison to all sorts of contextual uh, things? And what they've shown is that people, uh, when they evaluate their happiness, how, how much they're happy about their, their salary or the likelihood to quit, it goes opposite to actually what it is that they should look at in terms of the economic terms. Because this is a between subject design, if we force people to look at things in terms of economic terms, they're able to make sense and see that Anne is actually better off. But when you ask them about happiness, uh, it seems like uh, they believe that uh, Barbara will be happier and less likely to quit her job. So there's there's a kind of a, a bias, a very strong bias over here that we need to take into consideration. So the rational human being will look at the real monetary value, but a, a, a human will go, this, this is from the students, <laughs> goes in all sorts of different different directions. And I like this, that the, all the students, um, once again, Ignacio uh, helped us with, with this thing and it hopefully will be published soon. It's amazing that we were able to replicate all of these effects very, very consistent, uh, consistently. So you can see the original effect is 0.26 and our replication is, is to eight. Some of those are actually uh, stronger. So they're in problem two. Um, stronger than, than the original. So as people say, replications are always weaker, not necessarily. So over here, we see actually that some of our effects are stronger. Uh, and, and the different uh, types of scenarios that we look at are whether you take inflation or deflation into account when you uh, buy a house, when you consider the value of a house. Sometimes when people take a loan in order to buy a house, do they consider what the inflation rate might be? in the future and how this is likely to impact them. Do they take uh, into consideration the increase in salary that they might have over the years? So this is scenario two, you can have a look at this later, uh, whether to buy or sell an armchair, uh, at what time to do this sort of thing. So that's another scenario, almost a one-to-one -one, uh, replication of this effect. Uh, doing contracts, uh, looking at uh, long-term uh, purchases. So they did this back in 1990s in uh, Singapore prices, but uh, interesting uh, things about whether to buy or to sell all sorts of, all sorts of things. So our uh, inability to really evaluate reference point and understand the context, we just look at the simplest things. We have some uh, blind spots. So if you thought, all of these riddles, how is this uh, relevant to real life decisions? So now we have Shafir and Tversky and, and others, uh, she from last time with uh, less is better, actually reference points and assumptions and gorillas blind spots are very, very important in order for us to make sense of our environment and make, uh, and make good decisions. So by being a judgment and decision-making scholar, by running experiments, by following up on the literature, by reading judgment and decision-making journal, you might be able to arrive at better decisions. After you run this uh, a few times, you know, maybe the first two and three, you don't see your bias, you don't notice the gorilla, you don't know what your assumption is, but if you do this again and again enough times, perhaps you're able to debias yourself and then already see what is in the riddle, what is in the context, what is the reference point and so forth. So hopefully by the end of this, course, you'll be able to know a lot more about the way that you value things, the way that you make purchases, the way that you look at financial decision makings, whether to buy a vacation, not to buy a vacation. Does it make sense to spend $5 in order to postpone this if you know already that whether you pass or you fail, you're going to buy this? So I like judgment and decision making because it's very easy to see the practical implications about almost everything in our lives in any kind of, of decision. So that brings us to the conclusion of this course. Uh, I enjoyed it. Uh, I like uh, this kind of thing with the riddles. Thanks for playing with me. Uh, more entertaining, I think, than last week. Uh, I'll try and make more uh, of these types of interactions in, in future weeks. If you have any questions about what we did here today, of course, if you have any questions about your replications and extensions, if you need any help, just let me know. Tag me on the Slack and I'll respond as, as fast as I can. So that's it for this week. I'll see you next week.